Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Northway. Welcome to part three of this series called The Seven Letters. Welcome here in Wexford, of course, to all of our campus locations this morning. Welcome, and everybody joining in digitally across all of the various platforms. Welcome, pumped and excited to be here today with us all. So before we jump into the actual series content, a couple of things that I want to work us through, and then we're going to jump into Revelation chapter two. The first one is this. We are doing baptisms across all of our locations coming up in about six weeks. And, and here, here's the thing. Like if you have not yet been baptized, this is a great opportunity for you at any one of our, our locations. We have ways for you to get involved, to get connected, but, but never forget about the importance of baptism because Jesus himself was baptized. And as his followers, we should follow in his way. And he commanded the church to go and make disciples and to baptize people. And so this is an opportunity to be just like Jesus. So sign up if you have not yet been baptized. Second thing that I would like to do is, is I want to do just a little bit of teaching. I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about a framework that we see because we're about to, in this series, we're going to jump in and specifically look at all of the letters to the seven churches. And I think it's important for us to have handles to be able to understand what's going on in these letters. Is there, a, is there a pattern there? Is there something I should look for over and over and over again? Not just for now when we read through this content, but also for the future when you pick your Bible back up and you go to Revelation. This is the kind of stuff you can take notes on or grab a photo of because it will always be the pattern that we see in Revelation. But the Spirit will speak through that pattern differently to all of us in the different seasons of life that we're in. So I want to give this to us to help us have a framework. The first thing is this, that we got to understand that in terms of a pattern, these are things that show up over and over and over in all the seven letters. Each letter is anchored in who Jesus is. They open up, and you got to remember, Jesus is the author of these letters. John may have penned them, but they are Jesus' words. And in the opening parts of each of these letters is a little bit of a phrase, is a description of who Jesus is. And we've got to remember, not, not like skip over it like a genealogy list in, in the scripture. Sometimes I do that. I turn the page real quickly. Don't skip over the description of the author. It's important. It's, it's important to understand the author and remember him and anchor in him. The second thing is this. There is often, and this is, this is where our eyes go, there's often a commendation, something Jesus is praising that church for, and then also sometimes a correction, something they're not doing well, a warning perhaps, if you will, from Jesus to the church to tell them it's time to change. Third thing that I see as a pattern in these, in these letters, there is an invitation to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. That phrase is repeated at the end of every one of these seven letters. And that's so important for us to understand because reading the Scriptures to understand and unlock and hear from the Lord, it involves the Holy Spirit. It involves inviting the Spirit to give us ears to hear what, what's going on in the Scriptures and what's going on in our lives. And that's how we allow the Scriptures to read us rather than just us read the Scriptures. You see, I think that phrase is in there for a lot of reasons. One of them is it's teaching us how to pray when we engage the Scriptures. He who has ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Lord, may we all have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us in this moment of our lives. And then here's the fourth thing, and this is something I think I gloss over a lot, and this is why I share it. The conquerors, meaning when we heed the warning, when we follow Jesus' way, there is a specific promise for the conquerors. And that's incredible. That reminds us once again of who God is. And how great Jesus is and his goodness abounds and his mercy is for all of us. He rewards when we follow him. And these are the kind of rewards that matter for all of eternity. Don't skip over those. Highlight them, write them down and pray them into your lives. Those are four things. It's a framework for these seven letters. Now, on top of the framework, I also want to talk about what I like to call some keys to understanding and unlocking that framework. These are also things to think through and have as a bit of a set of glasses on our eyes as we read the scriptures. First one is this, remember, never, ever, ever let go of the anchor, Jesus. Like when you read the warnings, and you start to get a little bit anxious, you start to get a little bit self-reflective, you start to get a little bit worrisome, go back to the anchor. Anchor yourself in Jesus. Listen, have you ever been out somewhere and the fire alarm goes off and you look around and nobody moves? 
It's like a big warning and everybody's supposed to run because supposedly the building is on fire, but you've been there before, right? And this is kind of like the warning. You've heard this over and over again. I don't know if you have kids, like I know kids who, who live in my house and often what they'll say if they're in trouble. So is mom gonna give me the consequence or is dad gonna give me the consequence? You know what I'm talking about? Meaning the one who is giving the warning, it like shapes how intently we should listen to this warning. This is Jesus speaking. And we should remember who he is while he's speaking. Anchor ourselves in Jesus. Here's the second thing that we always must remember and shape our hearts around. We must remember that repentance, there's a call for repentance or change. Repentance is a beautiful thing, not a shameful thing. It's an invitation from the Lord to turn back to him. It's an invitation for love, for for redemption, for restoration. See, a lot of times we are more shameful about repenting than we are about sinning. It's not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to turn and face Jesus and experience his grace and his mercy. And repentance is supposed to be an everyday part of anyone who is a follower of Jesus. Remember, 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 it's a beautiful thing, not a shame-filled thing. Here's another thing you gotta remember. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit further, so I'm not gonna explain it quite yet. We must remember these letters, they were written to a specific church, but they are also for us. That's a key to understand and remember as we read things. And here's, here's the last thing. That last line in each of these letters, as it talks about he who has an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, it also specifically says to the church is, plural church. See, sometimes we are very individualistic when we read these letters. We focus in on the warning, we look at it, and then we look at our lives and say like, okay, is there anything I have to personally adjust? Is there anything I have to do? Do I have to get a little bit better at hiding things in my life, perhaps? Those are kind of where our thoughts go. But this is talking about the church is, meaning these letters are for a community. This isn't about just check your individual self, and if you're good, move on. No, this is about look at our community. That includes you. That includes me. That includes everybody who is a part of our church. This is a collective reading and a collective response. We are bound to one another as followers of Jesus and as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we must listen to, yes, the commendation and also the warning together and respond together. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to turn in this moment and we are going to start to read the specific letters. And today, we're going to read from Revelation chapter 2 and specifically the letter that's written to the church at Ephesus. And here's what I'd like to do. Just, just to, to change it up just for a moment, would you all stand with me across all of our locations? Go ahead, stand up with me for the reading of God's Word. This is Revelation chapter 2. Good morning, everybody. My name is JJ Falto. I'm the student ministry director here at our Wexford campus, and this is a reading from God's Word. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Hey, so I'm curious, as JJ was reading that, what what were you thinking about? What did you have ears to hear? What did your mind instantly go to as you were, you were listening to those words or reading them on your device or, or on your Bible? See, to me, as I, as I was reading this letter to the church at Ephesus, I got to be honest, the thing my mind instantly went to was the greatest television show ever in the history of, of humankind, The Office. 
I'm being honest, every single time, like I feel like there is an office clip I could play in every one of these sermons and I have to have restraint. But today I have no restraint. And I gotta show you, this is exactly what I thought of. This is a clip from an episode where there's a new boss in town in the office, the team, they're trying to respond to something very, very specific. Check this out. If he comes out, distract him. We need a warning signal. We don't need a warning signal, Kevin. I can see him right there. We do. I promise you, we don't need a warning. Warning! 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 warning. Ah! Phyllis! Phyllis! Come on, that's funny, right? Warning! Warning! I think about that all the time. I read the Revelation letters and like this warning sound shouts in my head over and over and over. And sadly, Kevin Malone comes to my mind over and over and over again. And, and I don't know if you're like that, but that's where I hone in on, right? I hone in on the thing Jesus said, I have this against you. And I start to think like, okay, am I guilty of that? Do I need to fix that? Do I need to adjust or, or shift something around in my life? Maybe, maybe about my family. Is there something we're off on? We've got to pay attention to this warning. However, we must remember this letter was written to the church at Ephesus and for Northway Christian community. See, that means we can't glaze over Jesus' commendation to that church. See, we cannot assume that the thing Jesus commends about them is exactly something he would commend about us. See, we cannot assume that we are right where they were right. See, because I look at our world, I look at the church, I look at followers of Jesus, and, and if I'm honest, I don't think we're real good at testing for truth. I don't think we can glaze over that real quickly and just move on. You see, if I, if I believe Jesus was writing to the, to the church at large today, I don't think he'd be saying great job at testing for false teachers, at, at examining things and, and really holding on to what's really, really true. No, I think the opposite would be true. I think Jesus would be speaking to us today and telling us to repent. We cannot glaze over the commendations. We must have ears to hear what the Spirit is telling us today because this letter wasn't specifically written to us, but yet it was written for us. Here's a reminder in case you missed it. This is what Jesus says. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. And he's praising them for having tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. They're really, really good at discerning truth and testing and wrestling with it. I know you were enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Listen, I don't think we are good at testing for truth. And I look at the world and there is evidence of it all around us. You see, when I look around, and this is again, this isn't just the world or the culture. This is the church. This is people all around us. I see a lot of evidence that tells me there are things on the rise that helps me understand we're not good at testing for truth. We're listening to a lot of false prophets and apostles out there. You know what I see when I look at the world? I see very clearly that anxiety is definitely on the rise, right? Anxiety is on the rise. Harvard, they did a study recently over the last two years, and they found that 90% of their participants have experienced more anxiety. That's fear, that's worry, that's sort of this debilitating paralysis in life because you're constantly consumed with the question, what if? That's what anxiety is. It's worrisome about something that could happen. It hasn't yet happened. And it's answering and going on and on and on about what if I do it too, right? 96% of participants are experiencing anxiety at a greater level. And a third of their survey participants are saying they're experiencing anxiety at a debilitating level to the point where they can't feel like they can move on. You see that, don't you? Anxiety is clearly in the system and it's on the rise. We're not good at testing for truth. Here's the second thing that I see when I look at the world. I see that conspiracy theories are on the rise. Now listen, before you get nervous, I'm not gonna endorse or put down any specific conspiracy theory. I'm not talking about one in particular. I'm talking about the sheer number and volume of conspiracy theories that exist today. Come on, there is a conspiracy theory for everything in our world. For the big things, like disease, 
and politics and the election to the like everyday things like a chicken wing shortage or is Meghan Markle really a robot or not? Right? There are conspiracy theories out there for everything. Listen, I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in the 90s. The, the biggest conspiracy that I had to sort of figure out was, is Tupac Shakur really dead or is he alive? Is he living on down in Costa Rica somewhere, right? But listen, this should tell us and alarm us. Because the more and more we have and face and deal with conspiracy theories, it tells us that there is a lot of skepticism in our hearts and minds. There's a real struggle to feel and discern what is true and what is right. And we're struggling to trust. That means we're not good at testing things. That means Jesus wouldn't tell us, hey, great job. Keep going at that. No, I think he'd be saying change. Repent. Here's the third thing I see when I look at the world. I see that the emphasis on personal feelings meaning my truth, personal feelings have become the new moral compass. It's on the rise. Listen, in our world right now, we're engaging in some really critical questions, big questions, questions about sex, questions about gender and identity, questions about who we are ultimately in this world. And honestly, what I see more and more and more in our world is that we are turning inward for those answers. We're trying to figure out, well, to answer that question, how do you personally feel? What do you think is right? And go with that because that's your truth. But listen, that tells me that we are starting to believe that truth is fluid. It tells me that we're starting to believe that truth is subjective. That's not what I see in the scriptures. Truth is consistent. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ. He tells us in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth isn't found in our feelings. It's found in Jesus. And we can't turn inward for these answers we're looking for for big questions. See, this is where we opened this series. We looked at who Jesus was, and I love that Revelation opens with a description and a picture of Jesus. And here are his words, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That means he's been there from the beginning, and he's going to be there all the way to the end. He is the truth, and it is constant, and it is consistent in him. We don't have to subscribe to every single conspiracy theory is out there because we know the one truth who is solid. He's the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and is to come. That means the question of what if this happens doesn't have to rock our world because we know who was. We know the one who is and we know who is to come. So we are in good hands. We are in the hands of the almighty He's the one we cling to whenever fear and worry and anxiety and questions start to rise in our life. We don't have to look inside. We can look to him. But we're not real good at that, are we? We're not real good at testing for truth. We are conforming more to the pattern of this world than we are to the pattern we see in Scripture. So you got to understand the word tested, it's not just showing up in the book of Revelation. It's found all throughout the New Testament. This idea, the Greek word for testing isn't like spelling test on Friday with a good review on Thursday. No, this is a bigger picture than that. This is something that takes time. See, to test means to actually find proof for or put something to trial. That means examining closely, learning the genuineness of something, digging in and wrestling and looking and looking again, not doing a quick Google search and taking the first suggested answers. It means examining, closing, testing over and over and over again because there are a lot of false apostles claiming to hold on to truth. And we as followers of Jesus, we are called to test those things. Scripture says it over and over and over again. First Thessalonians reminds us as Jesus' followers to test everything and only hold on, hold fast to what's good or true or noble or pure or praiseworthy. Wrestle with it. Examine it closely. Don't just take the first thing and, and run with it and start spreading it out on social media. No, test it and only hold on to what is true. Discern, hear the Spirit speaking. 
1 John tells us this, do not believe every single spirit. 2 Corinthians tells us that Satan will disguise himself as an angel of light. And then I love this passage because Paul was writing this to Timothy back then, but he could be writing it to us today. He says this, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They're gonna go find someone who says what they believe and cling to them rather than test, rather than examine, rather than pray about it. Teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I mentioned Romans chapter 12. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it tells us to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. That means to understand how to test for truth in our day and age. We also have to be very mindful of the pattern of this world. When you think about pattern, if you've ever been on a flight and they're not ready to land, you're just sort of circling the airport. That's what I think it feels like when we conform to the pattern of this world and we're using the world or our culture's methods of testing for truth as our methods. It's not supposed to be that way with us because we know the truth. See, here's what that pattern looks like. It's the pattern the world offers to us to determine and discern what is really real. I think it comes in the form of questions. Questions like, so does this thing, maybe, maybe you're trying to make a big decision about your marriage. Maybe, maybe you're trying to answer some questions you have about your identity. Maybe you've got questions about finances or your future or your career or, or entertainment that you're about to consume. And you're, you're wondering, like, is this true? Is this good for me? Or is it not? Oftentimes what we try to figure out is, well, does it support what you already think? Like, does it line up with who you already are? Well, then it, it must be true, right? That's a message culture gives us. That's a pattern of this world. Sometimes the pattern of this world that offers to us in terms of discerning or testing for truth is, is another question. Is this easy to understand? Meaning if you can't explain it or understand, it's probably not true. It's complex and it's, it's not for you. So just, just dismiss it. No, we're supposed to test and examine and wrestle and dig and ask questions and be in a small group and process it over and over and over again. Truth isn't always easy and obvious. It takes examining and looking closely. Pattern of this world also tells us, ask this question, well, does it support what you want to feel or who you want to be? You got a picture of who you want to be in the future. And if this thing, this new idea, this self-concept, this political, political movement, if this gets you to where you want to go, well, then it must be your truth at least. So grab onto it. It must be real. This is the pattern of this world. Ask, does, do, does it support what I want to feel or be? Here's another one. And this is common for, for so many of us. I do this uh, all the time in my life. Do a lot of people agree? Or does someone important, that I consider important, agree with this? Like if a celebrity or an athlete, why are we so consumed with celebrities? Why do we allow them to tell us what's real and what's true and how we should think? because we've conformed to the pattern of this world. We're not strong at testing the way the church at Ephesus was. The good news is, is Jesus is with us. He's not yelling from a distance saying, warning, warning, warning. No, he's with us. He is the one who's in the middle of the lampstands. He's telling us it's time to change. Get back to your first love. Here's also what I see in terms of what the world offers us. This is the last one, and I could go on and on and on, is, is this, do I see evidence for this thing? Not only do we look for a lot of people or a celebrity or someone important that we value, but sometimes we cling to immediate evidence of the eye. And you know why that's a testing that the world offers us? Because I believe that's Satan disguising, disguising himself as an angel of light, telling us that you don't need faith. If you don't see it immediately, move on. Life is short. And that's a lie. Faith is the evidence of things we hope for. We don't always immediately see it, but deep down, the Spirit testifies inside of us, and we know it's true even if we don't yet see it. See, the pattern of this world is in direct opposition to the pattern God offers us in terms of testing for Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna give us a grid. 
some questions to ask, to wrestle with, to help us advance in our wrestling, in our examination. Because listen, the, the, the attempts to give us truth, the apostles of our day are, are everywhere, right? Everybody can publish something today. Like anybody can go get a podcast. Everybody can get an internet site and and share something. Everybody can be magnified to our world. And we now more than ever must be as followers of Jesus, discerners of what is true. We must be strong at testing. So this is a grid. This is a lens to look through questions, four of them, to ask over and over again as you process and as you wrestle and as you examine and look for real proof for what is true. The first one is this. Does this thing, this idea, this thought, this pattern that, that I'm maybe aligning with. And listen, when I talk about testing for truth, I'm also talking about the media we consume. I'm talking about, should I even be listening to this thing or should I exercise my right with the mute button or the power button? The first test that we must use, the question is, does this align with Scripture? Scripture is true. It's God's Word. And I'm not talking about, hey, can I go find a verse that supports what I feel? No, I'm talking about the whole of Scripture. I'm talking about, does Scripture say this? See, I'm not talking about, hey, go figure out if you think it's right and then, then check Scripture. No, I'm saying start in the Scriptures. If you're wrestling with a question around your marriage or your future or your finances or your identity, don't go to the Internet, go to the Bible and see what it says first. Let it speak first to it. Because it is God's gift to us. You know, the church at Ephesus, they didn't have the whole of Scripture. They had the the eyewitness testimony. They had like the Old Testament. They had some letters that were circulating. We have a gift in the Bible. We have God's word to us, this revelation of his son and his love for us and his mission to redeem and restore us. And it's a guide to truth. We must look there first and ask, does this thing or this person who I'm listening to, do they align with Scripture? And if not, Turn it off. Run. Eliminate it. Here's the second thing that I think needs to be a grid or a spiritual lens that we look through is this. Does the Holy Spirit bear witness in you about this thing? You see, the Holy Spirit is described by Jesus as the one who will help reveal truth to us. And the Holy Spirit often speaks in terms of peace. If you're experiencing more and more chaos inside or confusion, or fear, chances are it's not true. It's not good. It's not noble. It's not praiseworthy. But if there is peace, and sometimes what I like to do is I like to confirm what I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking with other believers who are around me. I like to share with them what I'm thinking, what I believe the Spirit is showing and revealing to me. That's why we have to be in groups, in community, in relationship with other followers of Jesus because the Holy Spirit doesn't just speak one specific thing to this person and a completely opposite thing. No, the Spirit is consistent. And the peace you will experience about things will can be confirmed by the peace other people will have about as well. If you're ever wanting to grow in your relationship and connection and experiencing the Holy Spirit, read Romans chapter 8. And then read it again. Learn what it looks like to be led by the Spirit and walk according to the Spirit, not the flesh. Because when it comes to truth, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside of all believers will bear witness and confirm what is true. Here's the third thing. Does this glorify Jesus? That's like the the Sunday school answer, Jesus. But it's like the big one. See, Jesus is our hero. He's the hero of the story. He's the one that deserves all the honor and all the praise and all the glory. And what true things do in this world, they magnify him. They elevate him. They make him even more famous. Not that Jesus needs to be famous, but you know what I mean. They help people understand more and more of who he really is. And if someone, based on what you're reading or what you're understanding or what you're starting to believe in all of those areas that I've listed, if someone other than Jesus is the hero, run. It's not good for your soul. Test it, test it, test it, examine it. Listen, there is an election coming up this year again, right? We've got to be good at testing because more and more and more, and I'm I'm not saying that from any perspective other than the fact that we must be good at discerning what is true and which apostles are false. Does it glorify Jesus? Here's the fourth and final one. Does this 
thing or this idea or this concept, does it lead you to look more like Jesus? Not only does truth glorify him and and magnify him, but truth also changes us. Like the more I listen to anyone, the more I watch The Office, the more it gets inside of me. The more it shapes the way I think of humor. The more it shapes the way I view the world. And that's like anecdotal, but the media and, and any voice that we consume, it shapes who we are. And ultimately it leads us and causes us to live differently based on what we've just consumed. And truth should lead us to look more like Jesus, to be loving, to bear the fruit of the Spirit, to be gracious, to be kind, to not run from mess, but to run toward because we bear light. See, real truth should shape us to look more and more and more like Jesus. See, you may encounter some things that, that have really noble ideas, things that line up with Scripture, things that you feel like this is a good thing according to the Spirit, things that are even claiming to promote the name of Jesus, but the way they're causing you to act or what they're asking you to do, if it doesn't line up with Jesus, run. Because it's not true. It's not good. It's not noble. Now more than ever, we must grow in our ability and willingness to test and know what is true, just like the church at Ephesus was good at. You know, this, this idea of testing, it doesn't just show up in the New Testament. It actually is present in the Old Testament as well. There's a man named Job who was experiencing some incredible trials in his life. And if you know the book of Job, it looks like Job, but it's Job. If you know the book of Job, you understand that, that Job spent some time going back and forth in these dialogues with his friends and with God himself. And there's something that Job said that I believe is so important for us right now in this moment to really lean in and hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Job in one of his responses says this. He says, does not the ear test words as the palate tastes food? I know we don't typically talk like that. Imagine reading this in the King James Version, right? I'm going to read it again for us to understand it. Does not the ear test words as the palate tastes food? He's likening this idea of testing for truth with the way we taste food. Now, I got to tell you, like when it comes to tasting food and, and like a palate, I have a very, how would I call it, immature palate. I'm not real good at tasting things. I have like two categories. I like it or I don't like it. Like some of you, you're brilliant at tasting things. You would have what's called a super tester, right? You're in the 25% of the the world where you're really good at tasting things and you know the the five major senses when it comes to taste and you can pick out individual ingredients and I'm not one of those people. What's interesting is, is as I think about this verse, the palate tasting food, my family, my immediate family, my mom and my dad and my brother, they are super tasters. They watch the Food Network all the time and they get the ingredients and the science behind it. And I watch it and I'm thinking one thing, please change the channel. Like none of this makes sense to me because I'm ignorant. Like when I think about like the gene pool and my family, man, they got all the like tasting genes. I got all the charm genes, I like to think. (laughs) But I'm telling you this for a reason, not just to make a joke, although that was kind of funny, right? I'm telling you this because when I'm around them, honestly, sometimes I feel inferior. And I think like, man, you're so good at this. And I'm just like, for the rest of my life, I'm stuck not being good at tasting things. Well, it turns out science says that every single one of us in the 75% can get better at tasting. Our palates can grow and be developed and mature to the level, get this, of a master chef. There's hope for some of us three-fourths of us, but it takes work. It takes work to develop your palate. Some of the stuff I, I read said that in order to develop your palate, you have to eat differently. You have to slow down and savor your food. It means not eat while you're working, not eat with the television on. You know what that means in terms of our spiritual palate? We've got to slow down and savor God's word more. All of us do. 
We have to slow down and really taste it and hear what the Spirit is saying us as we do our devotions, as we read the scriptures, as we reread a book we read 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five months ago. We've got to slow down and develop our tester inside of us by savoring God's word. Not only do we have to slow down and savor God's word to get this, it said we also have to eliminate sweets and salts. I know some of us, we're sweet people. Some of us are salt people. Some of us, we're both people. I'm a, I'm a salty guy, right? I love pretzel chasers at the end of the day. It's kind of what I do. I eat a pretzel. It's my favorite thing to do. You know why foodies have to eliminate like the sweets and the salt? Because those are your preferences that blind you to other tastes. Some of us, we are so in love with our preferences when it comes to the church. We're not open to what the spirit is leading us to. And being honest, the very idea of standing earlier in the service really bugged some of us. If we want to grow in testing, we have to release our preferences and let the Spirit lead us. Not only do we have to slow down and savor our food and eliminate the sweets and the salts, we have to get better and better and better when it comes to eating. And and here's this last one, and this is a big one. Some of us, we need to cleanse our spiritual palates means we need to get rid of some things we've listened to or allowed to speak into our souls. That's why if you've ever been to a fancy meal, they give you some sorbet or some lemon or, or some water to like change gears between tastes. Some of us, we have clung to things and it's time for a cleanse. It's time to repent. It's time to use the mute button. It's time to run from something because it's simply not true according to those four tests. What's the Spirit speaking to you about testing? May we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Pray with me. Father, thanks for your challenge, for your love, and for your warning. Thanks for your scriptures that reveal truth to us. Lord, now more than ever, we want to grow and be more like that church in Ephesus who was, who was strong at testing, who clung to real truth and pushed everything else away. So Holy Spirit, speak to us now and show us what our next right step is so we can grow and heed your warning. I pray this all in Jesus' name.